So realizing that I deserve pleasure and that that should be at the center of all of my hookups was a big game changer. However, what I also realized is because of, you know, experience with domestic violence, experience with childhood sexual assault and all kinds of trauma, and also just the the natural stuff called oxytocin and all that shit that like, it's, that's how I got an abusive relationship is this dude gave me my first like amazing orgasm. And then I just cut. I don't even want to say dickmatized because I don't want to give him that credit. It was more like lickmatized, right? Because it had nothing to do with his dick. And, uh, but that like got really pulled in sexually. And then I couldn't see straight because my, 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 my clit has veto power over everything, right? And including my intuition. And I need to make decisions with my intuition, not my head, not my heart, not my clit, my intuition. And it's so hard to see Who's talking here when I'm overwhelmed with hormones and stuff? Melanie Hamlet. Hello. Uh, A woman for the women. (laughs) A woman for the women. Oh, let me tell you, this conversation is a big deal to me. Oh, yeah? Because you were perfect. You have all these experiences in all kinds of different ways, physical experiences, sexual experiences, life experiences, and you have so many amazing stories to tell. And I've been really excited about this interview since you said yes. And this is something that I like to do on my podcast. By the way, hi. Hi. (laughs) (laughs) So what I like to do on my platform is introduce women to strength that they never knew about before to elevate them to a place they've never been to before. And what attracts me to you is you've been a hardcore rock climber like me. You've dated hardcore rock climbers like me. Body count, who gives a fuck? I have no idea. (laughs) And your latest... Uh, your latest Instagram, which I watched today, which is I undersold myself until I realized I have a platinum pussy. And I need to elevate who I'm going to be with. I need to make them earn me instead of me trying to earn them. Because the one who's going to try and earn you is actually the one who's going to appreciate you. Mm -hmm. So welcome, my love. I like letting people introduce themselves because I want you to tell us the things about you that you feel are important. So just so that my listeners understand, I came across you, uh, Billy Bo's on TikTok, and you were talking about rock climbers. (laughs) And I was like, I got to take another look in this lady. And then I got deeper into you. But I want you to tell my watchers who you are. Who is Melanie Hamlet? Oh, man, I am always going to be figuring that out because I think we're always evolving, right? (laughs) Um, You know, uh, well, I think what the coolest thing about aging is that you you are not only deconstructing who you thought you were, but you're learning. You're just becoming a new person constantly. That's the whole point. Uh, By the way, is it okay if I cuss? Because I I cuss all the time. Okay. (laughs) You don't know me? My book for assholes. My relationship book is fix that shit. Okay. I, I, I'm, I've been talking on TikTok way too much. I'm literally incorporating sh- the word schmegs into my daily life. And I, I fucking hate it. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I mean, I thought I was a tomboy. I thought I was a big, tough chick, you know? And I, I mean, I, I am a tough chick, but like now I wear like pretty sweaters and like to be feminine too. It's like, all of the things that I always thought I was, I'm part of those things, but I'm a lot of parts. And a lot of those parts are contradictory. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tough, but I'm soft. I'm, you know, brave as hell. And I'm terrified all the time, you know, like I I'm, I'm, I'm all of it. And, and that's been the, one of the, the coolest things about my journey is, is realizing that I don't know who I am and that I, who I am is always going to be evolving. So five years from now, I'll probably tell you something totally different and that's all good. <laughs> we're not supposed to stay the same, you know, <laughs> because the fact that I'm a wife 
fucking blows my mind still because I was like, what the fuck? I don't want to be a wife, but I'm like, oh, right. If you, I guess that's, that's a good thing. If you have a partner instead of, you know, instead of, you know, just some dude who wants you to do shit for him, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I love how you talk. (laughs) <laughs> you were so right like this is I think this is why like I really kind of lean into you because like just from the first words out of your mouth I felt like we had very like minds um I I say I'm going to be growing until the day I die I'm going to be learning until the day I die and I think that's a really beautiful thing about humanity and also as a human being we have the ability to be every facet that we want to be you know I've sexually I've been uh, bisexual. And then now I, I call myself, this is, this is a new term. Let's use this if we want to sexually lazy. Um, I, <laughs> okay. I've never heard that. <laughs> I'm coining it today. Y'all can use okay. it. When you get to the point where you're like, you know what, if I never have sex again, I don't care. And I don't feel like doing those sexual things that take a whole lot of effort now. Like I'm very happy with my husband and the way we do it and our little routine and the little twist that we could put into the routine every now and then but you know my, my sexuality has just kind of narrowed into like a very s- easy I, I don't even know how to describe it but just like easy going easy going and and so mm-hmm. I've had I've had my heyday of like my promiscuity for multiple reasons out of insecurity out of seeking validation just out of fun you know that's a bodybuilder let's try one of those right mm-hmm. um and and so that fluidity of life of character of personality can flow into every aspect of our life and I feel we should embrace it mm-hmm yeah, I mean, I mean, I grew up in the South in the US. So, I mean, I come from white purity culture that literally politicized wo- white women's purity, right? So, you're not like what awful things have been made have been done in the name of my purity, right? And so one of the most important parts of my feminism was getting rid of that shit because it's not good for me and it's really not good for society in general. Um, now that I live in France, I'm like, Oh, wow. Like their attitude towards sex is so different over here. And it really is more my jam, you know, (laughs) what is their attitude towards sex? Well, I, I don't want to speak in general. I don't, I don't want to speak for the country of France, but I will say that, you know, uh, the, the, the whole purity culture thing doesn't really exist on the same level as it does back in the U S at least. Um, and you know, of, uh, of it's not like affairs are normal, but I don't know, like they just have their, they just don't have all the same rules, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And they have sex clubs over here. They have the libertine society. They have, it's just, it's, the way I like to think of it is their relationship with food is very similar to their relationship with sex. It's not about being good or bad. Pleasure is not a bad thing. So, you know, like, I mean, I eat, I eat the same way in my, 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 my relationship. I mean, I used to be bulimic and and have a tortured relationship with my body shocker. Um, and so my sex life as well. And over here, nothing is off the table. I, 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 you know, I eat baguettes, croissant. I didn't eat flour or sugar for 10 fucking years. Talk about like purity kind of culture into my diet here. I eat whatever I enjoy food. I, but because of that lack of like rigid rules around it, I don't crave crazy shit as much. Right. Um, and so, And so I think that because there's not such a taboo on sexuality and sex and pleasure, the idea of pleasure in general, um, there's not as much like, ooh, like there's, yeah, it's like when you, (laughs) rules are meant to be broken, right? So when I couldn't eat sugar, what do you think I thought about all the fucking time, right? And now that I can, I don't want it as much because I can do whatever I want. And so it's just like a healthier relationship to pleasure And, you know, sex being one of those realms that that plays out here. (laughs) I I love that we're we're bringing this up because you're in France right now and you're living there with your husband, Mm -hmm. a French man. Yeah. So what you're describing is the laissez-faire attitude of the Mm -hmm. French. 
when it comes to live and let live. Mm -hmm. Live and yeah. let live. And then we come over here into North America and it's body count matters. And there's a brainwashing taking place with women, which is uh, body count matters because uh, most men, right? Like they'll say that the people who are attempting to brainwash us. And let me tell you, I am undoing a lot of that, right? So those, I did a book tour with No More Assholes. My shtick in No More Assholes is no kissing for three months when you're looking for a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. I did a book tour with this and women would come in and I, I, I'd look for a ring. If they didn't have a ring, I'd go, looking for this and they see the title no more assholes and they come over because it resonates when you've dated those kinds of people selfish short-term thinkers you say to your girlfriends i'm so tired of assholes for me the title came from a moment when after my last hour climbing boyfriend i had hands up to the air slamming the phone on him because he was trying to manipulate me from afar um and and i just said that's not fair slam the phone down on the wall went no more assholes felt my entire being shift in that moment but when I show women a book like this and I say, no kissing for three months, when they bring this up, they go, oh, nobody's going to wait three months for, for a first kiss. This is women saying this. This is women echoing the brainwashing they've received. You're not special enough. Unless you're putting your body on a platter, you're not going to deserve the opportunity for a relationship. So we have this very sort of overbearing mentality when it comes to sexuality and seeking relationships on women that we shouldn't want to get to know what we're getting into before we get into it. We should just give in to them, give them what they want, and then see if that works out. Yeah. I mean, it usually doesn't. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that I don't know how many of my videos that you've seen, but you know, I, 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 I had a little a somewhat similar approach, but also different. You know, I mean, I, I came into my sexual power in my late thirties where I was horny as hell. And I also had a lot of uh, sexual trauma to overcome. And I didn't really want to, I didn't want to deal with that within a relationship. It was too much. So I used tender, a two prong approach dudes. I just took up with yeah. that. I can kind of get some sexual experience with that's positive where I can become more empowered to say, no, don't do that. Nope. Do this, do this. I mean, I became like, I mean, I never thought I could be that confident in the bedroom because I didn't even realize that I'm the one with all the power here. I have what you want. If you want this, you better fucking do some shit. You better drive across town. I'm not coming. I'm not driving 45 minutes to go get laid. You're and, and not only are you coming to my neighborhood, you better like pleasure me first, because otherwise, what the fuck are we doing here? I'm tired of using my body as your fucking right hand. Right. My 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 vagina is not a hand it is a you know like it so so realizing that i deserve pleasure and that that should be at the center of all of my hookups was a big game changer however what i also realized is because of you know experience with domestic violence experience with childhood sexual assault and all kinds of trauma and also just the, the natural stuff called oxytocin and all that shit that like it's that's how I got in an abusive relationship is this dude gave me my first like amazing orgasm. And then I just got, I don't even want to say dickmatized because I don't want to give him that credit. It was more like lickmatized, right? Because it had hey. nothing to do with his dick. And, uh, but that like, I got besides groomed and all that other stuff, I got really pulled in sexually. And then I couldn't see straight because I, my, 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 my clit has veto power over everything, right? In, including my intuition. And I need to make decisions with my intuition, not my head, not my heart, not my clit, my intuition. And it's so hard to see who's talking here when I'm overwhelmed with hormones and stuff. So I, for my own protection, had to have boyfriend material dudes that I take it very slow with. I didn't have like a you know, three month or I didn't, but I just was like, nope. Like, and I even be upfront with them right away. Like, Hey, it's never worked out for me. Well, when I've hooked up with someone right away. So like, I have to take this slow. If they liked me, they're cool with that. If they're, if they're not cool with that, fuck off, you know? And then, um, and then I had, but in the meantime, I wanted to like, I was horny. I wanted to fuck. I wanted to have fun. And I had the time of my life having one night stands, but I had to set a lot of boundaries around that. So that there's no way I could end up in a relationship, which is why I always hooked up with dudes passing through town or like something so that I couldn't get sucked into a relationship just because they're good in bed. Mm. Um, 
because the thing is, is that women lose in marriage under patriarchy. Women lose in relationships under patriarchy because we're just conditioned to give, give, give. I mean, I'm, these are generalizations, but this is just the system. This is systemic misogyny, right? And so men that are going to, men are going to benefit from getting into a relationship with me. So first of all, I have to know if they fucking like me as if we know anything, a lot of men will date and marry women. They don't even fucking like, they just want what she does for him. Right. So yeah. that's why, like I knew from the, from the first phone call that my husband was fascinated by me, not by me, my story, my, all of the things about me. And on a dime, if I say what, you know, what do you like about me? He'll name a bunch of shit, like no hesitation, right? Instead of you make me a better man, or, you know, you're a great wife and a great mother and all these things that I do for him or roles I do. He's like, God, your brain is amazing. You're the smartest woman I ever know. You're so funny. You, I mean, you know, get, you're a tornado rainbow. Like there's all these like fucking crazy descriptions. And I was like, oh my God, I've never felt so seen, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of women that are miserable, it's because they feel invisible in their relationships because the man centers himself and we just have to fucking fit in. Mm-hmm. And I'm so, and I was raised by a single mom. So I was not raised by someone who centered a man. Thank God, but under patriarchy, I'm still conditioned to do that shit. Oh, uh, will a man want to marry me? Fuck that. He's going to benefit. You know? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I do because like, I, just, I just kept having mental orgasms as you talk because like, <laughs> no one's ever it. said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the point of the no kissing for three months date. Well, if you can't hang around me for three months, why do I think you're going to stick around for 50 years and like me? Yeah, well, also, I mean, the thing is, is that if they're in it for the physical, you're going to age out. So they're going to fuck, fuck you over anyway. Like the, as soon as, and that's why, you know, like if, if it's just for your, if, it, if they're just attracted to your looks, you have the, the clock has already started ticking and you've got maybe 10, 15 years tops. And then as soon as you hit as soon as you have your, their kids, especially, and then they're like, oh, uh, then they'll just find someone new and start all over. So like, and I, you know, that's exactly what my dad did. So I saw it in real time. What happens when a man gets bored or just like, doesn't want to deal and just, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I it does, it, it's so funny because so many times people, when they see my stuff, if they don't know my story, they just assume I'm single because I'm so anti-marriage. And I'm like, no, 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 I love my marriage, mm-hmm. but the institution of marriage, it fucking sucks. And women usually don't benefit it from it unless they're very picky. Um, now, not self-sabotage because as a victim, you know, as a survivor of domestic violence and all that stuff, I almost sabotage the relationship with my husband multiple times because I'm projecting what all these other men did onto him, even though he's not doing that shit. So I also had to check myself and have a system around me to keep me from being really unfair and mean to him about stuff that he didn't do, but I'm, you know, so if you got a lot of trauma, you have to have, make sure that you're, you know, so, but anyway, people think that I'm, they're like, what? You're married? You don't hate men? I'm like, no, I love men. I have male friends. I love my husband. I fucking hate patriarchy. And patriarchy is what does this to men. Men are not born awful people who are selfish and self-serving. They're born sweet little boys and patriarchy makes them into these sociopaths. And unless they deconstruct that shit and women deconstruct it too, we're all fucked, which is why I'm going to be unlearning this shit till the day I die. New forms of feminism pop up, or sorry, um, misogyny and patriarchy pop up all the time ageism keeps creeping into my like oh melanie and, 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 and it's like oh god it's really it's literally just conditioned me to hate myself all the time so that i put up with bullshit and i buy a bunch of products and i hate myself and spend all my money hating myself so that i don't do cool shit that empowers other women and you know what i mean yeah i had any I, I was believing it for almost 20 years imagine what i could have done with all that time and energy and money yeah. imagine <laughs> yeah. you know so, um, so yeah, I mean, I, and that's why I write articles that also help men, inspire men, go get help, go get help. My husband helps men, like he helps them deconstruct their shit and I help women and maybe men, but like, whatever, I'm just here to, to fight patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> <I don't... laughs>
So I divide um, our mindsets into two. I'm a behaviorist, you know, like that's, you know, and, and I like to back all the stuff up with like sociology, psychology, and just like my own ideas and theories. And so I divide us into two groups, selfish short-term thinkers or generous long-term thinkers. And when it comes to relationshiping and how we're going to relationship with each other and who we need to choose, when we're in a mindset where I want to look after somebody for a long time, right? Like, I, I can't imagine you not coming into this relationship with a sense of generosity towards your partner. When you agree to commit to your husband, I would imagine if you're anything like me, you're agreeing to take care of this person, to watch them, to monitor them, to make sure they're okay, to fulfill them in, in the way that only you can because you are their romantic partner um, and understand them. And a selfish short-term thinker is, I'm not looking to look after somebody. I just want to be serviced, pleasure, here today, gone tomorrow. Don't want that long-term mindset. And what I caution women against is the selfish short-term thinkers who are lying about being generous long-term thinkers. And to use that no kissing for three months later, as a coach, I put the training wheels on the bike. And so the training wheels are very specific in order to help people, you know, if I say, well, wait till you know them better, then that question of when are we gonna kiss is constantly on the mind because we have this cultural sense here in North America that if men aren't making a move, then we're gonna think they're weak. And so they've been indoctrinated to lunge at us um, if, if they sense we have a look in our eyes because if they miss their moment, they might miss it forever. And we're just gonna friend zone, there they are turning friend into a bad word, even though it's the foundation of a healthy relationship. Um, and, and so I teach women how to separate the two by giving them time to talk and reveal themselves. Mm. Well, I mean, I, that's all more complicated than, than what I, I, I think I intuitively did this yeah. stuff, but, uh, you know, I, I basically just, as somebody who has had a lot of addicts and narcissists and people who are in, in, in doing really, you know, toxic behavior, including myself, I mean, you know, I was literally destroying myself for a long time. So, um, what I've learned about myself and human nature is their actions always show exactly how they feel. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, a, a lot of people will say, Oh my God, I like you so much, but they don't fucking text you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I don't believe you Sh like show me, like, don't tell me. I don't, mm -hmm. that's why, you know, the, I do believe like love is a verb, you know, it's like, and, and that's why, you know, I, the, it, I just paid attention. I started observing. I just paid attention. To me, the beginning was just about collecting data, yes. you know, and a lot of, but it also for what was important to me was, um, you know, I mean, I was like single most of my life. So it was easy for me to be single. It's a lot harder for a lot of other women to be single. I realized that because maybe they're not used to it and they're not, you know, and, and also our culture pushes you to just relation, relationship, 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 instead of, and, and you get shamed for being a, a single woman, you know, which is why I will always be a champion of single women. I'd much, it's so much better to be alone than to feel alone with a partner. Um, so that whole, you know, dealing with your shit, you know, like dealing with your trauma, uh, deal, like having that community of friends and just having that, having an active creative life, friend life, like a life so that when, when and when if or and if that person arrives you don't need them they add to your life because when you need somebody you know that's why i hate even in ho in the hollywood movies it's like i need you I, I don't i don't need my husband my life is better as a result of him being in my life but i don't need him yeah. in the way that we're taught and he doesn't you know what i mean yes. like it's 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 uh he doesn't complete me i do believe we're soulmates and I believe we, we absolutely make each other better people. But I was complete before I met him. I loved being who I loved who I was. I loved my life. I had a fucking great, exciting life. And that's why I never dated when I was not feeling good. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to attract somebody who maybe preys on insecure women or I, my, my vetting system, there'll be cracks in it. So like when I moved to, to France, 
Oh, I may hook up. No dating. No date because I, I don't I need my friend group. I need my solid foundation under me. Uh, if I'm unemployed or just anything, like if I'm going through the death of a parent or something huge where I really wish I had support, friends are what I need for that. Because then I'm going to end up relying on romantic partners for stuff that um, or looking for a romantic partner from a place of need yeah. rather than a, a, a partnership mindset. Right. Because those are not always the, the old school way of thinking is all about you know, it's, it's so obsessed with romantic love when friendships are my, my friend, Liz is my soulmate. Yeah. And my husband knows that she is just as important to me as he will ever be. And that's never going to change. And he loves that for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I live with him. I'm married to him. I don't have sex with Liz or any of the other stuff, but she is my person. She's my, you know what I mean? Do. That's healthy. That's yeah. healthy. Like he has his best friend too. And I'm not threatened by that. You know, <laughs> like, so that, that it's hard. It is hard. I always really encourage women, especially to, to be confident and be, be okay alone yes. before you go out dating. However, myself included, some of us get a little too comfortable being just alone forever. And a lot of, you know, I, it's like two things can be true at the same time. Once I did you know, once me and my husband got together, I have had so much healing of a lot of this relational trauma because I, this stuff wasn't going to come out in my amazing, you know, one bedroom apartment where I'm having, you know what I mean? Like it, it comes out through opening up through intimacy. And, um, you know, a lot of that healing is happening within a relationship, but if you haven't done any of the healing beforehand, you may choose bad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And there's, but there's only so much healing you can do in a relationship. Um, I, I came into behaviorism by starting with dog training. I was training dogs before I was training people. And <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> that's probably, I, I, I could see that evolution. <laughs> it is a seamless transition. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. it is seamless. Um, it was real because listen, I need to know why, right? I always need to know why. So the question at the time is, why is it when I change my behaviors, it changes the behavior of the dog beside me, right? I was mm -hmm. in Milan. I worked with behavioral issues. And so I, I wanted to research. I wanted to figure it out, this connection, like how do they think and perceive and react in the world? And then to me, so I looked into, <clears throat> I looked into their mentalities and I, I saw all these similarities between how we are. So when I'm trying to train a behavior out of a dog, a reaction out of a dog, lunging at other dogs, am I gonna do it when there's no other dogs around? No, I need to put myself in the situation, the dog in the situation. If I need to become less jealous and insecure in a relationship, yes, I can do a lot of work outside the relationship, meditation, rearranging my thoughts, my redirects from low self-esteem thoughts to high self-esteem thoughts. But when I enter that relationship and he's a baby daddy and she's competing with me because she doesn't want him to not want her anymore. And that insecurity comes up. This is an opportunity for me to do the deeper work because the trigger is there. So you're saying most of the healing is done within a relationship, not out. Is that what you're saying? Because I thought you were saying the opposite at the beginning. So, okay. Okay. You can do some outside, but the yeah. two aren't there. And so the remaining of the healing happens inside the relationship. And it's important to choose that partner that creates a greenhouse for you, a place where you can plant that seed of growth and grow it in a safe space. And then when it gets stronger, you can take that plant and put it outside in the elements. Yeah, no, I mean, at that before I met my husband, I would have disagreed with you. But now that I've seen, well, honestly, all of this, I'm in the EMDR and IFS therapy now because ever since it was like we got married. And then within a couple of months, I started writing a book about domestic violence. And then boom, all my, all my fucking physical, like my nervous system went haywire. I've been processing trauma since basically it's like, 
<laughs> we're newlyweds. <laughs> it's like a hey, happy marriage. Boom. Now you got to deal with a wife who's literally, I'm ha like having panic attacks, having, um, having to wear headphones because it's like, like he's crinkling the baguette paper and I'm like, ah, cause it's so loud. Like my nervous system went haywire and that would not have happened had I not had a safe place for that to happen. And even though I was totally safe in my single bubble when I was just taking care of Melanie, which is what I needed to do, that stuff couldn't come up until my, my one, I believe my uh, self-protective mechanism was to wait until I felt safe and at peace and with a partner who could handle that. Um, but it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have come up without him. Mm -hmm. But if I hadn't done a lot of work also before I met him, I would have chosen the same fucking guy I kept choosing again and again and again. I would have married my fucking dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not my dad, obviously. But I, I, I was like, why do I keep dating men like my dad? Well, because I had unresolved trauma I had to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. So I think some people get too comfortable being trying to do all the healing outside of a relationship. And then some people won't ever take that time to really get to know themselves and love themselves so that they don't choose men who will trigger that stuff and then aren't safe. And then they get trapped in marriages and abusive relationships and all that stuff like I did. Yeah. So I, I think both are important. I mean, I think we're on the same page about that for yeah. sure. But before I met my husband, I was like, nah, I don't need a man to heal, blah, 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 you know? And, and I honestly, because the stakes are so high for women, I do understand women who just tapped out, who are like, I'm just going to be celibate. I respect that. I would not have missed this healing for the fucking world, but I'm also really glad that I didn't settle. Yeah. I didn't settle. I, I had very high standards and I was waiting. I was willing to wait as long as it took. And I had fun, you know, with my little hookups and my one night stand. I had fun in the meantime, but I did not fuck boyfriend material dudes for a reason. Right. Um, because again, like there's guys that I have fun with, it's consensual, but neither of us want to date each other. It's just fun. Yeah. And then there's guys where I'm like, I mean, immediately I knew I was, when I saw my husband, I was like, mm, no, I have no desire to, to fuck him right away. I like him too much yeah. to do that, you know? Cause I didn't want to, I need that foundation. I needed that, especially as a survivor, I needed that foundation of trust. Um, I needed to make sure that we are healthy communicators because I know in my experience, every time right after I slept with someone I really liked, all of this insecurity came up. All I, I just, it's like something happens in my body. And, um, and I knew that I, I wanted to be in a very trusting, I wanted to make sure we had a solid foundation before that came up because it was, so when we did find, you know, finally have sex, it was not really, I didn't feel all that insecurity stuff because I was already feeling very secure in our relationship. So, you know, I, uh, and it's really funny because it's totally different here in France. People like I learned all of this is how I approached it. I came to France and, and like a lot of people, it's just normal to sleep with them on the first night as a way of getting to know them. But it seems to work for a lot of people. But my husband's French and, you know, he when I was like, yeah, I, this is how I operate. I can't. Um, sorry, that's my dog. Um, you know, I'm not I, I, I don't I don't hook up with guys I actually like. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, no, I'm in no hurry because we both saw a future with each other. Yes. You know, there's yeah. what, what's, I can, I can get laid literally any night I want. What is the rush with a dude I actually like? That's mm -hmm. how I broke it down. Like I have plenty of time for this and building that anticipation. Yeah. It's fucking hot. It's hot as hell. You know what I mean? Is it ever? <laughs> is it ever? And like, I mean, were you, were you, did you feel this was a more romantic journey even? I mean, honestly, when I, when I met him, it reminded me of exactly how I felt with my, when I met my best friend, Liz, except he was a man and I was attracted to him. Right. I just immediately felt comfortable. I felt safe. I could tell him anything. And I, I, but I didn't trust that immediately because I also, I need to protect myself. I need to make, because, yeah. you know, I, uh, and but I, what I realized was that I didn't have that butterfly nervousness around him. Exactly. I had, I had, I just felt, and actually my friend, one of my closest friends, she, uh, our second date, I had like a drum, a drum concert because I joined this drum club, a, a way to meet people here. 
and he showed up to it and my friends all my girlfriends were there so he was like in the lion's den day two new date two and um my one of my my closest friends she goes you have a boyfriend and i was like no we just was a second date she was like no 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 i know you and the way you behave in front of him is no different than the way you behave in front of us you don't you don't change at all you're comfortable you're not she and because she'd seen me in front of my ex who I was very insecure around even though I could act confident she could tell I was performing I'm making jokes trying to make them laugh. you know I was always just a little bit of like on edge I've never been on edge around Anthony yeah. never yeah. not since the beginning I've never been nervous around him um and that to me I mean that's what I want with a long-term partner I don't want someone that I'm afraid to talk to I don't want someone that I'm nervous. What, what they got? No. Um, so it was just seamless. It was so easy. But I still just to just for my it's it's like my boundaries are never with the other person. They're with myself. Yes. They're always with myself. Yes. Yes. You know, I'm not telling you what to do. You're free to do what you want, but I'm choosing to take my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I'm the one who you know. I have a long history of drawing a line in the sand and then someone just steps right over it. And then I draw another line, they step right over it. And I was like, I'm the problem because I keep drawing a line instead of walking away, you yeah. know? <laughs> How long did you take from when you met your husband to the decision to commit? How long of a, like how- Well, we have, so, so that's why like, th this is why it's complicated because it's a COVID situation, right? So COVID, you know, I don't, you, we have a, a we, we're a COVID marriage. And so the time doesn't really, so we went from seeing each other, you know, once a week, talking on the phone, you know, nightly for even just a little bit to being trapped in confinement in France, which, you know, is very different than North America. We literally couldn't fucking leave our house. Yeah. We had to have a permission slip to go to the grocery store. We had to be inside for 23 hours a day, only allowed out one hour a day. And you could only go one kilometer. So I, I, I literally was in a tiny flat. I went from, and that's crazy. So the timeline, it, it means, I mean, we went from seeing each other once or twice a week to 23 hours a day for three fucking months. That's the equivalent of like five years of dating. <laughs> you know if you think not maybe not five years but like yeah. so um so we i mean we don't have been dating like five or six months before we went into lockdown so you know and it's funny because my friends make fun of you because they know how resistant i am to commitment because i'm so afraid of i'm the committophobe here usually i'm so i was you know i've been single my whole life and then first person I fell in love with was at the age of 36 and he almost murdered me. So you can imagine I was a little like, fuck dating. I'm going to keep my heart open, but I'm also like, okay without it, you know? Yeah. Um, and my friend was like, yeah, Melanie, I'm not sure if you ever would have moved in with him if you hadn't, if the police hadn't forced you to, <laughs> you know, because I probably would have been so scared of making that leap. But when, when push came to shove and I had to make a decision, it was my, my idea. I was like, Hey, we, we should probably figure this out because the, the police are going to lock us in. Should we confine together or separate? And he was, he was like, well, I, together. Right. And I was like, yeah, that's totally what I was. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. And um, so I actually ended up being, and I'm the one who brought up marriage, which is hilarious because I've never wanted to get married, but again, COVID and being an immigrant have a lot into this. You have to make decisions a lot faster than normal people. If the borders are all closed, if someone gets sick in my family on my, on a tourist visa, first of all, he could never come back with me. What if a lot of my friends got trapped in the U S separated from their partners for two years, you know? And so we just, the whole COVID thing, like a lot of people got divorced during COVID, right. but a lot of people got married because of COVID because they were forced into like the most high stake situation ever. And so they kind of got to see their true colors way faster than you would if we'd taken it really slow. So what happened with us is not, it's not really comparable, honestly. Um, but um, yeah, basically he's even, even the, 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 the decision to come like kind of commit to just exclusivity. Um, 
that came from me only because he didn't want to scare me off. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, basically he went to Paris for one weekend and I got it in my head because I went on Tinder and I saw that it updated. He was in Paris. And I was like, my first thought was, oh, he's probably showing his best friend my profile because that's who he's visiting his friend. And then I was like, no, I bet he's fucking a bunch of girls. And so I made four dates with four different dudes to just fuck a bunch of dudes because if he's going to fuck people, I'm going to fuck. And that's my PTSD brain. Right. That's my that's my nervous system being like, that's my traumatized Melanie who's afraid of ever getting hurt again. So I'm going to fuck you over first so you don't fuck me over kind of thing. Yeah. But because I had my system in place of friends who hold me accountable and told them what I was, they were like, that's not what's happening, Melanie. That's not him. That's yeah. not him. If you go and screw someone out of fear and he's not doing anything, you're going to hate yourself. And I was like, yeah, that's true. I probably, so I didn't, I didn't do it. I held myself in check. I, and I didn't, you know, text him like needing, you know, needing validation. I just let him enjoy his weekend. And then when he came back, he was like, oh, my friend thinks you're beautiful. And I was like, how do you, how did you don't have photos of me? He goes, yeah, I showed you your profile on Tinder. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, you want to hear a funny story? And I told him that story. Yeah. Now, most women would never tell a man how fucking insane they are, but I, but I felt safe with them. And I was like, you want to hear what I did? This is what I almost did. And he was like, damn, you are really self-aware. Bravo. Bravo for figuring that out, for holding yourself accountable. And also for not sending a bunch of crazy texts to me because of jealousy, because I've dated really jealous girls in the past. And it would have been a big red flag because, you know, I wasn't doing anything wrong and I kept in touch with you, but I would have been a little scared by that. And I was like, yeah, that's what I didn't want. I didn't want to project all of my trauma and my insecurities and fears onto you unfairly because you weren't doing anything wrong, you know? And so that conversation, I was like, he was so impressed by how much inner work I'd done and how much restraint I used to not accuse him and blame him for something he wasn't even doing mm-hmm. because I, I had my support system of honest friends instead of being like, yeah, fuck that asshole. Fuck him for opening tender. I don't need people like that in my life. I need people to keep me in check who are like, Melanie, that, why are you doing this? You're doing this because you're, you're feeling vulnerable. That's literally the only reason why you go fuck a bunch of dudes right now not because he did anything wrong. And, and, and I was like, yeah, fuck, you're right. I'm going to feel bad about myself if I do that with that motive. So I did it. And so being able to tell him all this and him being impressed, he literally was like, you're, the way your brain works is fascinating. It really is. He's like, but bravo, bravo for do, you know? And then, and then, and then I was like, by the way, I've, I've realized that maybe I do want to have a label on this. What are we? because I think I kind of want to be exclusive with you. And he goes, Oh, good. I've been wanting to hear that from you, but I know your story. I know what your ex did to you. And I knew that that needed to come from you, but hell yeah. Hell yeah. I want a commitment. And so I was like, okay. So uh, uh, he knew how resistant I was to committing, how terrified I was of all this stuff. So he intuitively knew that I was the person who needed to bring up that conversation because I did not need to feel pushed into something. So it's just funny because like a a lot of the rules and advice that people give, our relationship ended up playing out differently, but that's because this man is so emotionally intelligent Mm -hmm. and that we have, you know, he, he knows there's something wrong with me before I do. Like I even wrote an article for glamor calling, like (laughs) it's being like, I'm the dude in our relationship. Am I, you know, like, and, and that's fine. Like, so, so anyway, the, the point is, is, and that's again, why I, I do believe that setting up your community of people who keep you confident, keep you in check, who will be honest with you instead of just co-signing the lies you tell yourself, you know, all men are assholes. Okay, sure. That, that's helpful. <laughs> instead, it's like, okay, Melanie, where's this coming from? What's going on here, really? And then I can, you know, not dump all this shit on him, but he knows everything. But the way that it comes out in a relationship is a much healthier way than Melanie just being, you know, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You're just like all the other men. Fuck, nah, 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 nah. Cause that's my self-destructive stuff. That's the ironic protector yeah. that tries to protect me and then always screws me over because it's actually gets the opposite results <laughs> than what I need, you know? Yeah. 
I'm, sorry, I'm going on and on and on, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure you're the dude in this relationship just because you were the one to speak what it is that you wanted from him. I teach mm -hmm. with this all the time. Be upfront. Tell them what it is that you want. I want a relationship. I'm done my play time. I'm ready for this now. And this is what I want to do with that long-term partner. I want to have kids. I want to get married. I want to buy a house. These are my goals. These are my plans. What about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just saying, dude, that sounds very gendered yeah. language. I don't like it because I'm also, you know, like I, I mean, I'm a mess. I'm like, you know, there's always trash in my pockets. There's all these things that he actually loves about me. He calls me tornado rainbow, you know, nice. because I'm like, yeah, like, you know, oh, you leave, you know, you're a fucking mess, but I love it because you're a beautiful mess that leaves color all around you. I'm like, God, I've never felt so seen in my life. <laughs> you know, we are interesting to intelligent men. Mm -hmm. Intelligent men know that in order to keep us, we need to fall head over heels for them. And that's why they give us that respect of not demanding from us, not saying, I want you to give me your commitment. Mm -hmm. Give it to me when you're ready. And I'm here just waiting for you to be ready because I've already given it to you. I mean, I, I firmly believe that if a guy truly likes you, well, it's, it's some men just want somebody and that's what you also have to be careful for. It's like a lot of men will do all check all the boxes. They'll, they'll do all the, but that's why, I mean, it's funny because I accidentally a, a, asked my, my husband this when we were first dating, cause I was writing a book proposal and I had to write an about the author page for my book proposal and I was like I'm really struggling with this because I know what my resume is I know I was an outward bound instructor and he was like I was like can you help me with this and he I mean I actually pushed record on my phone because he was just like babe you're like and they just went off on this whole thing and I was like oh my god and a lot of a lot of women don't ask you know like don't 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 ask that question or just you know just just listen for does this man see you right not not to, not does he see what you do does he see you does he see your qualities does he see your heart your soul your brain because if all of he sees is like a woman with these body parts that he wants that service him then again you will age out of that shit yeah. right yeah. and so i mean my husband is so sometimes i'll catch him looking at me not sometimes often i'm on the couch watching tv and i'll see him secretly just staring at me like and like at admiring me and i'm like what and he was like oh baby i love you so much and i'm like god stop i mean i love it i'm like don't stop like stop don't stop because i'm like it's fucking embarrassing because he's such a cheese ball and i'm not used to that i'm used to you know men who fucking ignore me or just like i'm a burden right and so it's also a lot of it shows a lot of my own internal work that i can accept that love because yeah. it may, if you got some unresolved trauma, that shit is very uncomfortable. Yes. It's, it's, it's jarring. Yeah. You know, um, it's still a little uncomfortable for me, but I'm, 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 I'm getting used to it and I'm, and I'm, I'm embracing it and, and, and I love it, but, um, but I'm still like, you know, such a, such a, a cynic at heart that I'm like, bah. you know, I talk shit about it, but I love it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think that discomfort comes from unfamiliarity. I've yeah. never, you know, like my husband, and I fought for 10 years. First of all, he's loved me better and more than anyone ever has. And, you know, just despite that love, we did fight for 10 years because insecurity, you know, when I talked about the baby mama, that that's my story. And so it was really difficult for me to deal with a situation, watching my man treat another woman better than me in some, in some instances, in some ways, because the children are growing. They're still children. They need his time, his attention. They need the parental support. And he needed to support her so much more than you would a typical woman because she is a selfish short-term thinker. And so there was so much more work he had to do in order to ensure his children had security. Um, and so when we stopped fighting, 
you know, my clock was saying, hey, it's fight o'clock because your pattern is fight, make up, bit a piece, fight, make up, bit a piece. And the first few months where there wasn't a fight, we were like looking at each other at the corner of our eye, feeling this tension in the air, not quite understanding why it was there because we weren't disagreeing about anything. And yet there was this pressure. And I realized after, you know, it's like, we're fine. And then pressure and, oh, you know, like I kept us from fighting. I kept us from fighting because it takes two people to fight. And my husband was trying to trigger the fight because his brain was saying fight o'clock. And I was matching my behaviors to my intention. I don't want to fight. And so I was doing what I needed to, to not react when he came at me with fire in those moments where he was trying to get that fight going. So instead of reacting, I did this, no fight happened because it takes two. Um, and so that unfamiliarity is super uncomfortable. And I kind of want to throw something at you to typically how I explain how we choose bad relationships over and over again, because I did that. My mom was abusive and who I picked replaced her. And I was in that relationship for three years and I was also abusive. So I certainly perpetuated the cycle. And we talk about trauma and we talk about, you know, I picked these people because of my trauma. And I like to introduce evolutionary psychology into this thought pattern, which is before we were this, we were early homo sapien and early homo sapien lived in the jungle. And familiarity meant survival. I know where the food is. I don't starve. I know where the predators are. I don't die. And when we went to a new territory, it's unsettling because I don't know where those things are. And so my survival goes down a notch, my, my, my percentage, because I might stumble into something or eat something or starve. So we still have that in our brain, the seeking the familiar, because it is comforting. It's comforting because it helps our survival. There's certain things from evolutionary times, like, you know, caveman times, we're still functioning on that coding, but now it's a dysfunction because we don't need it in this environment anymore. And so I don't need to seek the familiar anymore. I can think about who I'm choosing and not just let myself get drawn into the familiar patterns that I experienced before I chose this relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've also, my, not my EMDR doctor was also introduced the idea of like, it's not just my, you know, trauma or PTSD that makes it very uncomfortable for me when times are peaceful. It's also an evolutionary thing because our brains are like, we got to kind of have to be on guard. Like, uh oh, shit's too peaceful. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not I'm not a big science person, but I do know that one of the one of the most I really love I forget which book it was, but Gloria Simon um, had a book where she talked about her uh, her relationship with her her dad and just traveling all the time and stuff like that. And, you know, it really made me reframe a lot of stuff. It's not that like, I, you know, I seek out toxic men. I seek out abusers. I seek out. Not, it's 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 the idea that like. When, you know, of course I kept dating men who reminded me of the only thing I knew. I mean, my dad literally ignored me. The only time he saw me, he ignored me and watched football or, and, and I walked on eggshells around his, his temper. So for me to date a man that I have to walk on eggshells, around, that felt totally normal to me. That felt familiar. That felt like being at home yes. and everybody wants to feel at home, but yep. if your home is full of maladaptive trauma responses, then maybe you should, you know, I, I kind of looked at it like this. Like I had a, an old mentor who was like, look, Melanie, you've been walking on your hands your whole life and like, you're pretty good at it and it's worked, but it's really not good for the long run. So now you're learning to walk on your feet, but you're kind of like aerial. You're like, ah, and it doesn't <laughs> feel right, but like, that doesn't mean it's not right. So for a while, I had to seek out things that were uncomfortable to me, which was being loved, dating, you know, like, yeah. and also because I, I grew up in a family system where I had to be on guard all the time. I'm used to there being an inherent threat in this, in this drama. Mm -hmm. So peaceful times are uncomfortable for me. That's when I start thinking, okay, like that's the most dangerous time in a cycle of violence is when things are peaceful because you know it's coming you just don't know when so you have to be more vigilant 
And so it's for the longest time. And maybe you, I, I think I did a TikTok on this recently being like, oh, I hate drama. I hate drama. I hate drama because I do. But I'm the fucking drama because when things are peaceful, I create problems. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because my brain is just like, yeah, but what if he's cheating? I mean, I, every day I still am like, maybe my husband's going to die today. Right. You know, like I can't not worry about some shit going wrong because my life is really good now. Yeah. Whereas before I had actual real problems happening. <laughs> and now that my life is really fucking good, um, it's so uncomfortable, you know? <laughs> One last question. Yeah. One last question. Um, you've rock climbed, right? Mm-hmm. You outdoor rock climbing. How, how, what, what grade were you climbing at? What was your, what was your, your best? Uh, is it the same in the, in Canada as the U S cause it's totally different over here in Europe. So yeah, that's right. You guys do have a different system. So yeah. So 510, 512, 513. Yeah. Okay. The 510. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because I, I, it depends if it was track climbing, I could follow, I mean, I could, I don't know. I could lead five, five, 10, something trad. Um, just so and, people know, trad is traditional. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Nothing <laughs> bolted into the rock for you to hook a carabiner in and then attach a rope. You have to haul up all these little gadgets and pieces that are going to fit into crevasses and cracks. And they're then, heavy as shit, too. Well, it's heavy <laughs> as shit because it's all metal. It's yeah. all metal. And you have to like be so certain that if you take a whipper off of this, mm. which is a big swinging fall, it's going to hold and not zipper line off. And then here you are laying on the ground. So mm-hmm. five ten is like, that's pretty kick ass, right? Like just, a, you know, five, seven is like five, six is a ladder. Five, seven is a bit more difficult. So mm. getting to five ten is like, woo. And it's mm-hmm. really bad. So that's scary stuff sometimes, right, Melanie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you take that fear, which I mean, I'm afraid of heights. So that for me is one of the biggest fears is taking a fall on a climb. Mm-hmm. And let's just say that's your biggest fear, or I don't know, what, what would be the biggest thing that scared you? Like you're, you're, you're sitting there going, I'm shitting my pants right now. What would be just really short? What was the situation where that happened? When I was climbing or, or in life, was it, was it climbing your scariest moments or like, not scariest moments with people, but like, mm-hmm. so I could kill myself right now. Oh man, I've had so many. I don't even know where to start. Cause I was also a raft guide. People died in front of me. Like I, I was just around okay. danger all the time. So, you so, know, <laughs> I got to pick one. <laughs> truth be told, you've been very afraid outside of relationship scenarios. Now when, and so have I. I, my husband and I, after 10 years and, you know, me finally getting my shit together and like Mm -hmm. calming my mind, choosing my behaviors, choosing silence before I spoke so that I I could train myself to stop being so dysfunctional. And we stopped fighting and our relationship got better, more secure, felt more solid. We're living on a property that I dreamed of, which is, you know, he works in a shop, he bends metal and I work from home, I write books and I talk to people. And, and so this was my dream for the shop and the house on the same property because he works from seven o'clock in the morning till 1230 at night, no joke. So oh my God, how do you ever see each other? <laughs> well, he, does, well, he, you know, he owns his own business. He's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Too, right. And I wanted the house and the shop on the same property just to facilitate kind of like being connected and looking after him. Mm-hmm. And um, here we are, right? It, it's, it all fell into place. I got the man. We, our relationship is getting more solid because I, we stopped fighting. I, I see that we can really make this work. We're on my dream property. I have it all. Mm-hmm. I have it all. And I remember laying in bed at night with fear going through me like a freight train because mm-hmm. if I had it all, I could lose it all. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Did you experience that? Fuck yeah. No, right after we got married, I was, well, I never say I have it all. Cause I've always, I always want more. Maybe that's a little capitalist in me, <laughs> but, um, but which I'm trying to unlearn, <laughs> but, um, I, after like the first, every night after we got married in the beginning, I was like crying and I, and he was like, what's wrong. And I'm like, 
it, it, you know, because I, I didn't really think out the whole marriage thing before we got married, because that's kind of how I am. I'm like, oh, I'm going to move to France. Boom, I moved to France. Then I get to France and I'm like, oh, shit, this is hard. Uh, I stuck through it. I loved it. But like, yeah, every adventure I've ever done, I kind of, I, I know it's going to be hard, but I don't really like, I just focus on getting there and then, and then I just throw myself in the pool. And that's what I did with marriage. I knew it was the right decision to make, but I didn't really realize what, what I had gotten myself into until I was, I was like, oh fuck, like we lived together. Like I, I never really lived with anyone. I was like, oh my God, but, and it's the best um risk I've ever taken yes. but uh, other than moving to France I loved the oh, actually all of my risks I've ever taken I'm very proud of but I cried every night and and I was like it just it I was like oh shit this is why I never got in relationships because the the longer we rely not rely but the more entwined our lives are the more we we rely on we we meet we support each other I have more the longer you go the more you have to lose mm -hmm. and I was like oh my god uh, what if you just like it, I'm so used to being a single woman who takes care of herself right I got married at the age of 42 and I'd only had really a couple boyfriends very short term what the first one almost murdering me and right. so I was like you know what I don't need it I'm fine I can take care of myself so now I'm like oh shit that's right like now I have to, it, it, at some point you're gonna die maybe a week from now maybe after me who knows but like it's going to fucking hurt, you know? And like, it's that thing of, yeah, absolutely. Literally right after we got married, I was like, oh my God, this is going to hurt so bad. If something happens to you. Oh, that's right. That's the risk you take with love, you know? Um, which yeah, I hadn't, I, and it's like a lot of things we understand in theory, you know, it's like the, the, like the other day, I, 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 sorry to keep bringing up TikTok, but I really figure out a lot of stuff just talking on TikTok. And the other day I realized one of the things I didn't realize how dangerous men were I, in theory, I did, but until I was literally pinned down by a man terrified for my life, mm -hmm. uh, afraid he was going to murder me, I didn't fully understand how dangerous they are. Yeah. Right. Because then I was like, oh, this is like a, a real fear because I'm a tough woman. I can take on. No, I can't. They're fucking strong. They are strong and he could snap me in half. And I've never felt that vulnerable. So in, 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 in a happier example of that, like, holy shit, this is this is real. It was like, oh, I love you so much. Oh, fuck. Like, this is going to hurt if you die of, uh, you know, like it's it's we, we know what it is in theory. But it's a whole nother, oh my God, when you actually are like, oh, fuck. Like experience, I'm an experiential learner. That's literally why, I, you know, I did all the jobs I did. Um, I, I, don't, I don't understand things until I experience them, which drives my parents crazy. Because like, could you just please learn anything the easy way? No, I have to have a lot of pain. And then I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm all over the place. That's okay. Do you and your husband make out a lot? What's that? Do you, do you and your husband make out a lot? Do we make out a lot? Kissing? Oh, yeah. I mean, I get it's like depends on what you think of it, but we're very affectionate. We're very, um, uh, what's the right word? Like, yeah, we're both very touchy, feely, like sensual. And I don't know if that's because he's French. I doubt it, you know, because there's a lot of stereotypes with French, but, you know, I've had French boyfriends that were not that sensual. So, but yeah, um, but like, it's just, I think make out, I'm like, what does that mean? I always think I'm like a fucking teenager who thinks in teenager terms. <laughs> uh, coming together and like, you know, my, my homework for couples is minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each. My husband and I far surpass that, mm. um, you know, so, so just coming into each other and coming into that kiss and enjoying that kiss. And for me, uh, I was watching a TikTok one time. I love TikTok. You can talk about TikTok all you want. Yeah, I love TikTok. I love it. You'll lose me. You'll never lose me because there's so many educational people on there. Exactly. Um, and so there was a schizophrenic who sees people, figures. And he draws them. There's this is is cool to watch him, and they talk to him. And one thing that he he made a TikTok about this. He says something that they say over and over and over again is, "Don't be afraid of death." Because when you die, you go where you want. If you think death is a field of daisies, that's where you go. And so <laughs> I've taken that to heart. And yeah. 
kissing my husband, I lean into that kiss with every ounce of my energy and soul. And I say, and I'm saying this in my head, this is where I go when I die. Oh, that's pretty romantic. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> it's funny I'm so not romantic by nature I have to teach myself this like my husband is he he literally has written um, as soon as you walk in Hamlet Boisson the amazing team and then I love you so much blah, blah, blah. and I'm just I'm still like I'm still like god but I really do believe that softness exists in me that romance exists in me but because I was so fucking scared of it and been so hurt by men that I you know, it, you have to kind of pull it out of me. And luckily I have a, a safe place to tap into that, you know, which I used to be a very toxically masculine woman. I was like, fuck love, fuck the color pink, fuck blah, 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 blah. And now I'm like, oh, all those things are great. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> you know, the most wonderful thing you can say, the most amazing thing, the most, the most impactful thing you can say to a man. And, you know, I, I, there's men and there's guys and you have a man. And the most impactful thing you can say to a man is thank you. I appreciate that. You're such a good man. Mm. They're conscious of their behaviors and they're conscious of choosing behaviors that are good and of service to the people that they love. And they're not asking for anything in return except for recognition and gratitude. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I definitely sometimes forget to appreciate my husband. He never forgets to appreciate me every day. He sends me messages like, I love you so much, baby. Blah, 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 blah. He's like, again, he's a cheese ball. He sends like, you know, little like, kissy, emo like all this stuff. And I'm, so I actually have to force myself to do that back because again, I'm, I'm a withholder, not by nature, but by conditioning of a lot of experiences. And so part of my journey is to not withhold love from the people I love so much yeah. because in the past I gave it to people who didn't deserve it and withheld it from the people who did yes. so um so yeah I like literally I'll be like oh Melanie ah you know because he loves it like he loves it when I just look at him and surprise him out of nowhere and be like I love you so much or you know if I say it in French and he's like oh you know uh, <laughs> I, I man, he sounds like a words of affirmation followed by physical affection person Mm. And, and I can tell you're a physical affection person. I wonder if you have a secondary language. <clears throat> have you guys done a love language quiz? No, but I, I do think that acts of service is, is a, a thing for me because, you know, oh, sorry, there's a mosquito. Um, because I, I'm not a gifts person. Mm. If, he brought, if he brought me flowers home one day, I'd be like, what the fuck? Like, I would much rather travel with you. Or, you know what I mean? Um, and I, I, I and I have said this before on TikTok too. I realized the other day that one of the most romantic things he's ever done is when I was like, I'm, I told him I was constipated, mm -hmm. and he like while I was on a Zoom call with a client, he like was down there googling how you deal with constipation. And then he print, then he then he tra you know translated it into English, printed it out, um, and then took a highlighter and highlighted all the main points. And when I got out of my Zoom call, he goes, "Here, this is what you need to do." And I was like, "Oh my god, I feel so loved!" Like that shit is means the world to me. If he brought home a dozen flowers, I'd be like, do you even know me? <laughs> you know what I mean? So again, he, 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 he loves me in the way that he intuitively knows I need to be loved because he's a very emotionally intelligent man who has, who has worked on himself, you know? And, um, and I try to love him in the way that I know he needs to be loved. And again, even though I have a lot of resistance to doing that because of my own fear and, and even just lack of experience, you know, this is my first real, real, like healthy, long-term relationship is even though I'm 42 or no, I'm 40, I'm 44 now, but I was 42 when we got married. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I, I think I, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. <laughs> uh, it sounds to me like you're doing a fantastic job. It sounds to me like he feels loved and it sounds to me like you're not letting your emotions dictate your behaviors. You're letting your mm. logic dictate your behaviors, which is the most incredible thing a person can do. Because when you logically find your way, the emotions are good. So I, I love that you've done this journey. I appreciate that you had this conversation with me because like I said, to me, you're kind of a big deal. 
So (laughs) (laughs) you're kind of a big deal. Yeah, thanks. I I don't get told that much, so I'll take it. (laughs) I appreciate you so much, Melanie. This this thank you. Thanks for reaching out. I'm glad that you ran across my TikTok and then and then and then found you know did all of the stuff to 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 make this happen. What made you say yes? I don't know. I just uh, I love talk. I love sharing my experiences with people because, you know, I didn't go through all this bullshit for nothing. If it mean, if any of my story helps, um, someone else, uh, of any gender, like see something or even just give hope because yeah. that's one of the things that I do know is my, is the strength of mine is, you know, uh, if you, you've sur- a survivor of childhood, sexual assault and domestic violence is actually in a really fucking healthy, loving relationship. I don't come across that often. Mm -hmm. So if I'm blessed by that, then I I want it because, because when I was gotten out of that violent relationship, most of the people I came across who'd been in a similar station were like, fuck men, I'm never doing that again. And I understand that I do. I, and I respect that, but I, I, on, on some level, I'm like, but I've been single my whole life and I don't want this fucker to win. If I literally just give up and then he won. And so almost my stubbornness was like, you know what? I'm, I'm still going to always be open to love, but my fucking standards are as high as they could possibly get because uh, that getting the, the reason I ended up with him is because I ignored all the red flags and I was acting from a place, you know, of, I was just coming from the wrong place. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was also, you know, he groomed and manipulated all kinds of stuff, but I, if uh, someone else would have walked away after those couple warning signs. And I was like, oh, well, whatever, you know, fuck it. What's the worst that can happen? Well, right. I'll tell you what you can, almost get driven off a cliff that's what (laughs) so so anyway yeah I said yes because if any opportunity to share my story and give some hope or whatever like my husband calls me a disco ball he's like you're like (laughs) you're like shine rainbows he loves the whole rainbow thing he's like you shine light and rainbows everywhere but you also help people see themselves because of your storytelling and because of this the skill that you have of just help helping people take from your stories whatever they need so if if someone took something from this today that's good yay my job's done you know (laughs) if not then I hope I at least made you laugh you know (laughs) I honestly think this conversation has been a diamond because Mm -hmm. because we hit on so many different facets that women can take from whoever's listening and use what you said to increase their confidence in themselves to increase their hope in what's available to them. Mm-hmm. To let them understand the journey, right? Because mm-hmm. it is a journey. And I, I gotta say, like, I, I don't I don't think people who are single should call themselves a dating coach because a dating coach does two parts, help you find the right partner and stay in that relationship. Otherwise it's a repeat client. Mm-hmm. So that's a pickup artist, right? Mm-hmm. If you to do this, that's a pickup artist. Yeah. Um, but you've done the journey, you understand the nuances. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that in this conversation. And I appreciate you so much for being so open and so honest and so transparent about yourself and not giving a fuck about what yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's taken a lot of work on myself too, because it's hard to tell your most vulnerable, you know, to, to it's hard to be a, a writer and an artist. Cause you know, you, I'm sure, you know, you, I get trolled by lots of men, especially who are like, I hope you die. And I'm like, okay, well, you clearly need to work on some shit, <laughs> but I'm fine. You know, it takes some, it takes a, it takes thick skin to not let people's opinions of you yes. mold you, you know, but we're all still human. So we do care a little bit. Yes. You know, or I'd be a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. For sure. There's an insecurity is in our, our coding for, mm. a, reason. for mm-hmm. a reason. It helps us understand where we fit because I don't want to be president. I don't want to, mm. I don't want to be premier. I don't want to be up there. I want to be right here at this level. Mm-hmm. Melanie, if I can ever be of service to you, please let me know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, let me know when this comes out and I'll, you know, share it with my people, my, you know, whoever follows me on whatever, you know, <laughs> I put this on YouTube for with video and on my podcast. Okay. Video. Ah, I oh no, know. people will see you. I'm like, yeah, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> Listen, I went, I went curly hair. Don't care today for you. Okay. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah. I'm glad I don't have any stains on my shirt because I usually I do. My husband's like, your shirt's on outside. Uh -huh. out. <laughs> this is my thrift store find. <laughs> okay. Well, it's nice. Nice to meet you face to face yeah. or, you know, video to video. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Melanie. I appreciate you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks for, oh, thanks for your way, time. If yeah. people want to find you. Yeah. Do you want people to come find you? Of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm, TikTok is my favorite platform. So that's what I, and, and I have like, you know, um, um, I don't know, a, a, a decent following there. I like Instagram, but TikTok is like, it's just my jam. That's where I get to like talk and do, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Uh, also my website. Yeah, I've got like over 60 articles that I've written for all, you know, the major publications and stuff. Um, I'm also a writing coach. If anybody wants to tell their story, just get, just get in touch with me through my website. If, anybody wants that so is it melaniehamlet.com yes perfect i will and if you just google melanie hamlet it'll come up it's you know so along with a lot of articles i don't know if you know that i was like in the tabloids for being a cougar <laughs> not in the tabloids but like I oh yeah if you if you look at if you look at the the one of the pinned videos in my tiktok it's about being slut shamed all over the british media as being a cougar <laughs> it's actually it's it's it, 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 it's a great story but yeah it's like you know what meet my husband I guess I'm always a cougar because he's five years younger than me <laughs> just go to show body count doesn't matter it doesn't no. matter with our ability to have an amazing relationship yep yeah my husband is very proud of all of my stories including all of my crazy sex stories because he knows that's a part of who I am that, that, that helps shape me. So again, he doesn't give a fuck about body count. Yeah. None at all. Live your life. Have fun. <laughs> and don't selfish short term thinkers, insecure, controlling, absolutely will ask men. Never mm. Melanie, I could fucking talk to you all day. I know. I know. I should probably go. Cause it's like dinner time here in France. So <laughs> I usually, I buy, by an hour, I'm usually piecing out. And yet we keep having things to talk about. We should be <laughs> friends. So Anytime, if I can be a service to you, I owe you. I owe you. So if I can ever be a service to you, please let me know. It would be absolutely my pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, thanks for giving me a place to talk about my stories. So thank you, Melanie. Okay. Have an amazing Bonne nuit. <laughs> Bonne nuit. <laughs> bye. Okay. Bye.